This here's the Yukon Trail, another exciting product from Mech. Welcome back. We're all here for another roundtable discussion on Half Glass Gaming. I am Julian, goddammit. I got the Rev. I am the Rev. I got the Mandy. And I have the Josh. The one and only. I saw another one the other day, so you might need to check your facts on that. <laughs> it was pirated. <laughs> a pirated Josh. <laughs> He had a beard where the mustache was and a mustache where the beard was. It was crazy. <laughs> that, that, that was the piracy protection. Exactly. <laughs> and you could tell it was a pirated copy. Yeah. The RM facial hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome back, folks. You know, we're game in half glass style. Man, uh, before we uh, convene today, I got to tell you, I was watching, I, I binge watched a DC uh, TV episodes. I got through Flash, I got through Arrow, and I got through Legends of Tomorrow. Oh, boy. <laughs> Josh and I don't usually watch much TV, but I think we've been watching TV almost every single night for the past week or two. Yeah, we have. We've been watching uh, Community, Mm -hmm. which uh, I haven't watched all the way through before, Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to do that now. And we've also been watching Steins Gate, which Mandy recently finished the Steins Gate video game, and now we're watching anime. (laughs) I've seen the anime, and I've been the video game before, but Steins Gate is one of the best constructed time travel stories of all time, so Mm -hmm. I I don't really get sick of it. But uh, no, I I got it on Blu-ray, so we've been watching it that way. There's no way to watch it digitally, which is a giant pain. Mm-hmm. I own Community on DVD, and we're still watching it on Hulu because it's just <laughs> easier that, that just, way. You know. Who wants to get up and change this? I day. don't. I uh, I don't watch a lot of TV. But when I get it into my head that I should watch something, I just binge the shit out of it. Like, I watched all of the uh, new Doctor Who from, you know, Eccleston onward uh, in, like, a three-week period. Mm -hmm. I tried watching, quote-unquote, and I'm going to do it, live TV the other day. Ew. And, uh... Gross. Making an air I landed on... I I, I legitimately landed on the Big Bang Theory and... I said no. Josh, Josh loves to give me crap. Hating the Big Bang Theory is not an unusual thing. (laughs) But he loves to give me crap about it. Like, we'll go to the game store and buy something, and there'll be Big Bang Theory stuff in the bag. And he'll be like, look at the bags, Randy. Look at the bags. Or he's, like, (laughs) telling me about some Stephen Hawking thing he saw on Reddit where Stephen Hawking said he thought Big Bang Theory was a good show. Yeah, Stephen Hawking did an AMA, and someone asked him... Like, what's the funniest thing you saw on TV recently? And he said the Big Bang Theory. Wow. And even, like, the person who wrote the article that was, like, condensing the, the AMA was like, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, I mean, the, it's terrible because if I got to talk to Stephen Hockey now, like, that's what I don't want to ask him. Like, how do you like the Big mm-hmm. Bang Theory? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, <laughs> you know, the, the, it's the smartest people in the world that like the dumbest shit. Yeah, that, yeah. that happens sometimes. I mean, I just... I just get fascinated trying to figure out why people like things Mm -hmm. that I don't like. And most people, like, you'll be like, well, well, why do you like that? And they'll either get really offended or they'll just give you a plot description. Yeah. So either they think you're being super judgmental or else they just think, well, if they know what the plot of this is, they'll see why it's so likable. (laughs) But I feel like Stephen Hawking could at least back it up. He is much smarter than me. He probably has reasons for liking Mm. bad television. And I would, I would like to know them. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Whenever I talk to somebody who's talking about camping, I really <laughs> like listening to them because camping is just the most unappealing thing in the world, Jerry. And when they talk about the stuff that they get super excited about, it sounds like the worst thing in the world. And I'm just like enraptured <laughs> listening to them because people like to talk about why they like camping. It's not like they TV do. where they get super offended. Yeah. Like they will go into great detail. Oh, yeah. I work with campers. I know. Yeah. Explaining why it makes it great and so at least I can get some insight there without somebody getting mad at me or telling me the plot to a Big Bang Theory episode. <laughs> but I mean you like camping in Tomb Raider. It, it, it's not really camping in Tomb Raider. It's it's walking to pre-lit fires and upgrading your survival skills. Yeah, or listening to one of her uh, insightful internal <laughs> monologues. <laughs> I like that they 
her journal entries, because then you just imagine her, like, sitting out of bed, like, dear diary. Yeah. I, today, I, I got bit in the face by a wolf. <laughs> I, I like the idea of camping, but I very rarely like have enjoyed camp the actuality of camping, which is how I feel about so many things involving the wilderness and survival, like actual camping, video game camping. I like the idea. I very rarely like the actual the actuality. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of an episode of uh, Parks and Recreation uh, where they go camping, and uh, what is his name? Tom Haverford. Uh, yeah, Tom Haverford. Yeah, he shows up. He's got like a tent just full of like <laughs> electronics. He's got his you know Xbox or whatever, and he's just got it hooked up to the battery in the truck. Yeah, that's the that's the way to camp. That's how I would camp. Yes, my camp. My idea of camping is opening the sliding door in my living room while I'm gaming. You know, <laughs> it's re. Ridiculous. But Tomb Raider has this thing called survival instincts that yes. you upgrade at the campsite. Or L1. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> See, no, I, I, haven't, I haven't played Tomb Raider enough. I don't know this. No, when you press L1 and it like... Um, yeah, and this like, big screen pops up and then you can upgrade your survival instincts so you know you get good at taking stuff from animal bones mm-hmm. or something. No, uh, yeah. Better at scavenging. No, but she actually has this um, sonar ability where you Oh hit yeah, you L1. hit L1 and then it's your survival instinct and like stuff will light up. And sometimes you see where you're supposed to go, but mm-hmm. sometimes you don't. And that's kind of annoying me because there's not a mini map. Mm-hmm. Well, you have to survive. Is that is that like the the hearing mechanic in The Last of Us? Exactly. Well, or, I mean, it's like any game. I would say with any mm-hmm. sort of super sense, so detective mm-hmm. mode with your sense, except you're yeah. not you're not solving crimes. You're you're jumping on buildings so mm-hmm. that you can jump onto airplane wreckage. You're right. solving wolf murders. and everything will remain highlighted as long as you don't Some, move. Hmm. This wolf was clearly attacked from behind, but mm-hmm. by who? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, that's the only one killing wolves. Oh, I'm the one killing them. Really the, the, the least practically dressed character yeah. is the one killing all the wolves. This unknown assailant was clearly impractically dressed, but who could it be? I mean, the Witcher in The Witcher Three, you saw some deer murders and things. That's true. Oh, what monster killed this deer? Mm-hmm. You don't that. examine any feces, though, which is kind of a disappointing part. Do, do, you, do you examine feces in <laughs> Tomb Raider? I haven't you don't examine that, feces right? in any game, which is unfortunate, I think. I, you, you're just, you just rip-roaring for a game where you can just inspect some piles of shit. Huh? I mean, I'm you, pretty you sure. piles of poo and I'm, I'm, that's true. I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you some do... Some of it probably some, got in his mouth. I mean, <laughs> fighting is a form of inspection. <laughs> you're in, in, inspecting each other through battle. Mm-hmm. Understanding each other's I'm, sh- I'm sure that if you search the right kind of websites, you will find some video games about in- examining shit. <laughs> I'm sure there are some. I mean, even some survival games where you... I can't think of any of them. Yeah, I mean, you use poo for strategy and don't starve. In, uh, oh, that's in true, yeah. Ark Survival Evolved, you, there is stuff that you can make out of dung. Mm. You can inspect poo and don't starve. Yeah, you can. But yeah. I don't. I just pick it up and use it to make farmland. Mm-hmm. So, so there's two survival games where there is poo. Arc Age is a MMO where there's a lot of a lot of farming in it, and mm-hmm. and you know using poo is is a mechanic in the game. Mm-hmm. And so you raise cattle, and then you make the cattle poop, and then you can grow crops. Poop based strategy. So mm-hmm. so very realistic. Mm-hmm. But no, I mean Josh has kind of been thinking about survival games all the time for for like months now, and he'll be like. What survival games can I play in the PS4? And so I'll go and research, and none of them will be out. And then a couple months later, he's like, which one of those came out? None of them came out still. <laughs> yeah, I've just been on this kick where I want to play, like, a good crafting-heavy survival game and I uh, on the PS4, and I haven't found that many. I recently tried to install Rust on my PC, which is an early access, and it, it didn't run. And so I had to get a Steam refund, and uh, no, I'm just... Just really jonesing for a good survival game. Yeah. But if if you want it crafting heavy, Ark Survival Evolved is crafting heavy. I'm so excited for Ark Survival Evolved, but it's not on the PS4 yet. It's on Xbox One and PC. It's coming out. I thought it was coming out this summer. Yeah, I think it's coming out this summer. Mm-hmm. But 
the survival genre is in this weird place right now where everything's in early access. And so if you have a high power PC and you can run these games, you're probably you're probably being overwhelmed with too many survival games. But if you have a PS4, it's like, okay, I've got Don't Starve. I've got How to Survive. Yeah, there's mm. How to Survive, mm-hmm. which is definitely not choice pickings for a survival there's game. There's a second one coming out on PS4 this year. How to Survive 2. <laughs> <laughs> what a novel he didn't name yeah. any device. He really broke the mold. <laughs> Should we go to three or four? No, I think uh, I think we're gonna have to go with two on this one. <laughs> but you've been playing this war of mine. The, the I was gonna one. mention that. Yeah, that's a survival. Yeah, the, this war of mine is kind of scratching that itch. It's it's very depressing. It is but so depressing. I play it like a total sociopath. So I'm, I'm I, all right. <laughs> he probably is. I I have referred to it as the most depressing uh, version of The Sims ever. Mm-hmm. And, that's, yeah, I mean, that's pretty accurate. And, and what annoys me so much about it, I said that uh, on an article that I wrote for a site that I was working for, and then, like, a month later, some somebody on another bigger site, so it probably got seen by far more people, used that exact phrase, and I'm like, fuck you, that's my phrase, but I can't prove it. <laughs> should have DRM that shit. I should have. <laughs> it's really dark, and... It's uh, the point of it is it's uh it takes place in Bosnia. It's like it's uh, occupied Bosnia. Mm-hmm. So you've got enemy soldiers watching your town, so you can't leave town. And so you and some other survivors have to just survive as long as you can in occupied Bosnia. And as the game goes on, you're forced to make more and more difficult choices as you start running out of options of, mm-hmm. of things to do. And I ended up in this this house of this elderly couple, and I just stole all their shit. And they were, and I think they were kind of senile because they. I walk in and they're like, "Oh, what is this strange man doing in our house? <laughs> He's acting very weird. What's he doing?" And I was just going through their stuff and taking all of their food. Because, like, all of my people were starving to death. Mm-hmm. I was like, I, I got to do this, guys. Sorry. Mm-hmm. You're, you're old. You're going to die. You already got anyway. one foot in the grave as it is. Yeah. So, so I, I stole all this stuff. And then I got back. And and all of the people in my, in my like, hideout were like, like, oh, Boris, I can't believe you stole from that elderly couple. We're turning. We're becoming animals. <laughs> and everyone just, like, sits in their bed and, like, holds their head in shame. Mm-hmm. It's like, fuck, if you don't want this can of peaches, I'll eat it alone. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what were you calling it? Bosnian sociopath simulator? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's about right. I uh, I came up against the uh, the old couple, and I, ju- I just couldn't do it. I'm like, yeah, and then I turned back and left. I'm like, well, that's a night of scavenging completely out. I was in the basement of this apartment building, and I was, like, rummaging through stuff, and then I he- overheard there was a kid upstairs, and he was like, looks like I'm going to have to take care of my mom and dad now. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that man. Was <laughs> just I like just, that. And, like, uh, that kind of shit just happens everywhere. Yeah. Or and, and some people, like, I was scavenging in this grocery store where, you know, you'd think there'd be plenty for everyone. Mm-hmm. But there was this guy in the back, and he was like, oh, you're scavenging. I'm just going to shoot at you. And I'm like, well, fuck. See what? I went into the grocery store, and the guy was like, there's plenty to go around. And like, I, see, I all also just had one, together. I, I also had a situation like that as well. So, you know, the, the game throws just some random stuff at you, I think. Hmm. It's a really well done game, but it is really heavy. I, I can never play it for longer than like seven or eight of the day in game days, even when I'm doing well. Yeah. Because it's all in grayscale. It, it really forces you to examine, you know, this is what's happening. And it, it really forces you to realize that no matter what you do, you don't have enough. Mm-hmm. Like, there, there's just never quite enough resources, never quite enough space to carry what you find, never quite enough food to, to feed everyone, and you're you're going to get depressed. You're going to watch people suffer and die, and you're just going to have to live with that. Or you're going to have to steal from old people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic game. It's really good, and uh, I believe at least one of the developers actually lived through the occupation of Bosnia in the mm-hmm. 90s and was putting a lot of personal experience into the game. And mm-hmm. it's it's designed to force you to think about that kind of stuff and think about, you know, humanity and think about, you know, what kind of situation could get you to do 
horrible things mm-hmm. to other human beings and things like that. It's very, very cool. Great. Well, I think with that, I'm going to uh, insert a break. Of course, I have to thank some folks. Because this, this podcast isn't just done by the four of us. There are two others I'd like to thank. 2XAA and Wheelie for the music. Uh, you can find us on RetroBulb.com. We also find a wealth of uh, retro-themed articles related to video gaming. You can also find us on HackGlassGaming.com, where we have a detailed list of all of the games that we discuss in every episode. So you have no excuse not to go back and check out the cool shit we talk about, because it's the coolest shit. You can inspect this shit. Yeah, inspect that poop. Of course, we're also on iTunes, Stitcher Radio. Uh, So when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about survival games. So just hold on a little bit longer. Welcome back from the break. Obviously, uh, you survived. You wanted to stay alive, and you stayed with me, and I told you that would work, and it did. (laughs) (laughs) It's a Tomb Raider reference, sort of. (laughs) No. Look, Tomb Raider, at this point in my life, dictates my life. That's why I'm wearing a muddy tank top, which also happens to be the awesome clothing choice of John McClane and the smash box office hit Die Hard. (laughs) <laughs> and that's also why his breasts were, were pushed out to 150%. Yeah, just heaving. But listen, let's get serious, folks. We're here to talk about survival games. So what makes a survival game a survival game? I mean, I would say a survival game is a game where you're placed in a harsh environment and the primary game mechanics are about uh, using the resources, the limited resources around mm-hmm. you to stay alive. Mm-hmm. So it's not all just shooty, shooty, bang, bang. No, I mean, a lot of survival games don't have shooty at all. Curious. And some of them have shooty mechanics that if you rely on them, you're going to get mauled by a bear. Uh-huh. We kind of have a little bit of a working definition for what a survival game is. Mm-hmm. Where do they start? Uh, actually, I would say that the Oregon Trail was probably the first real survival game. And the Oregon Trail was actually originally released in 1971. Mm-hmm. It was um, exclusively available in Minneapolis public schools for years. Really? Uh, yeah, I mean, and none of us went to Minneapolis public schools or were alive in 1971, <laughs> for the record. But, uh, no, uh, it was developed by uh, teachers in the Minneapolis public school system. They, and then later on, they got a grant from the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium. Then you could play it in school districts throughout Minnesota. And mm-hmm. then from there, it spread to school districts all around the country. And I would imagine most people, at least people in our age bracket, yeah. uh, first played Oregon Trail in school. Oh, yeah. What was the point? I don't, I'm don't. i thinking about it now. It's like, it, was, it, it was to survive to the end. But I mean, like, yeah. obviously well, the point of the game, but what was, was the to, point of... It was to teach you about what the settlers had to go through when they were trying to uh, to settle, you know, towards the West mm-hmm. by traveling on the Oregon Trail. Mm-hmm. And it was, yeah, I was giving you some historical context. Mm-hmm. It was right. teaching you about diseases you, you're probably not going to be able to pronounce as an mm-hmm. elementary school kid, uh, and may not might not have ever had any experience with at all because modern vaccines eliminated them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, showed you that just because you have a lot of one resource doesn't mean you have a lot of the other. You know, bankers started with a lot of money, but they had a harder time on the trail because they weren't used to the hard labor, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of valuable lessons. Yeah, clearly I, I was, I was too good at, at, at shooting wildlife in the Oregon Trail, so I would go out with almost no food and then kill everything and then easily make it to the end. Yeah. I just played it too many times and it, figured out the system to easily get through with mm-hmm. minimal problems. It, it also taught you how much fun it was to uh, watch your friends die of old diseases. Hmm. I, I think we all named the characters after our friends to see who would die first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you would have like your friends, you'd be in the computer lab, and then your friend would die, and you'd be like, Hey, Tommy, you just died of... Well, you got to choose what was on their tombstone. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's so on your tombstone? And uh, there was actually a pirated version of the Oregon Trail uh-huh. that a lot of people 
wound up with on their computers mm-hmm. and one of the people had a tombstone that said here lies Andy pepperoni and cheese and so all these versions of the Oregon Trail even ones that school systems <laughs> installed were pirated versions and so you'd see that Andy tombstone everywhere that's hilarious I think it comes from um, the two old tombstone pizza commercials yeah, exactly. where they'd be like here lies so and so pizza there were several versions of the Oregon Trail right or yeah, there were a lot of versions of the Oregon Trail, and uh, I would I don't think any of us have probably even played any of the original versions. There were sort of new versions released every couple of years. I played the old black background with a lot of green and white version, mm-hmm. and then I played uh, the Oregon Trail Deluxe, which was released in the 90s, mm. which was yeah. a lot more colorful and better looking and had uh, some more complex mechanics. Mm-hmm. The original version was like text only, right? Uh, yes, it was. And uh, there were also other games in a similar vein. I remember when I was a little younger, like 10, 11, I played a game called the Yukon Trail. Well, that was also made by the same company, the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium. Similar in nature, although uh, instead of settling, you were traveling the Yukon Trail to go pan for gold up in Alaska. I ended up the same thing. You would, uh, you know, choose what type of person that helps your starting money, you know, taught you about what was happening on the trail. There was a boating section where you had to figure out, you know, what boat got you down the fastest, but also was most maneuverable, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there was a, there was probably other games of a similar nature. The, the Yukon Trail is the only one I know of off the top of my Amazon head, Trail. but Amazon Trail apparently. Mm-hmm. So uh, Odell Lake. That, that's all that that Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium did is make educational PC games mm-hmm. to be used in schools. Did they make Spellivator? They they did not make Spellivator, but they they made Dino Tycoon, Dino Park Tycoon, which you made fun of me for liking <laughs> the other day. Dino Park Tycoon sounds great. No, it, you have to manage a dinosaur park. And it's, it's not, like, disasters. It's really practical and, like, looking at graphs and making financial projections. But, mm-hmm. like, I said that. And Josh is like, what? And then I, like, show him a picture of a dinosaur in, like, a lab coat and glasses. And I'm like, look at what a cool game this is. Yeah. And he's like, of course you would think that looks like a cool game. <laughs> well, like, I would love to play that game if once things started going wrong, you had, like, a Jurassic Park scenario. Yeah. That would be fantastic. I will always fight for the functional park. I think... I think a really great game would be making a functional park and then at some point everything breaks down and the difficulty of dealing with getting rid of these dinosaurs or putting them back in captivity or whatever is based on how you built the park in the first part of the game. I think the first non-edutainment survival game was probably Wilderness or Survival Adventure, which was released for the Apple II in 1985. Mm -hmm. And that really had almost all the mechanics that people associate with survival games today. Your plane crashes in the middle of a wilderness, and you have to uh, use the environment around you to build a shelter, uh, build weapons, find food, and survive and then eventually find a way to escape and get off the island but uh if you don't find food and don't find shelter or anything in time you'll just die in the wilderness and you won't be able to get off ouch but there were very few survival games released in the 80s and 90s there Mm -hmm. was um unreal world which is uh came out in 1992 and a lot of uh, sources will credit that as the first survival game, but obviously that's just not true. Right. What What was the reason? Do you think that there was just this? I mean, they're incredibly popular today. So I yeah. mean, there's just this gulf between these earlier ones and sort of where we're at now, where it just wasn't catching on, or what? Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly part of it. That the big, super popular survival game was an edutainment game that most kids played at school and mm-hmm. not a game that kids were buying for their computer or their consoles. And so there wasn't really one big hit to spark a creation. And I think there was clearly a demand for it, but I don't think people were necessarily looking at the way kids responded to games like Oregon Trail when coming up with games to develop. There are certainly games. I played the survival game, the survival kids games on the Game Boy Advance, okay. which were released in the 90s, and uh, that eventually became the Lost in Blue series, and in most cases, say, okay, it's, yeah. you know, kids stranded on an island and surviving, and eventually mm-hmm. finding a way to escape from the island. Just picking boogers and... 
There's um, SOS on the mm-hmm. Super Nintendo, mm-hmm. which I loved. You're on a ship, and it starts sinking, and you... Uh, can make your way off the ship fairly quickly, but if you, like, leave with the, the people you're with or don't rescue anybody, then you'll get a bad ending. Mm-hmm. It is very fun. The controls are clunky, but it's a fun game. Absolutely. I, I mean, I... I love this game called Raw Danger. That was on the game. Yeah, yeah, that's um the disaster from the disaster report. Ex- series. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was pretty cool. I mean, it you know it's like this what, like a tidal wave hits the city. Um, you got to find clothes that are appropriate and food, and you play as different characters, yeah. I believe. And what's funny about that is those games are extremely Japanese, but every single one they've brought over here, they've changed characters' names. They've gone so far as to change characters' hair colors to make them look like white people. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh, and Which is what I'm looking for in my game. <laughs> <laughs> but I know there was at least one character where they just gave them. And I mean, it was all they did was change the, the character's hair color. Yeah. Because there was not complex facial modeling in that game. <laughs> but, there wasn't uh, complex anything in that game. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's a very popular series in Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, one of the more recent ones got delayed because the disaster they picked was an earthquake. Yeah. And there was a major earthquake quake in Japan right near the time it was released and they thought oh, it would be really insensitive to release that now. Yeah. So they delayed it and uh, it came out a lot more recently. But no, that's a really interesting scenario because it's not in the middle of a wilderness. It's in an area where at least you as the character are very familiar with, but everything has changed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a cool series. So I think in the, in the mid-90s with Resident Evil... Uh, survival got mixed with horror, and mm-hmm. so you had the survival horror genre. I think that idea of survival really carried into the next decade, and really most of the stuff I'm familiar with from like late 90s, early 2000s, that's survival is basically survival horror. And even now, when, when I was looking for games for the PS4 to find that were survival games like so much of what i was finding was actually survival horror Mm -hmm. and or just horror and not really a survival game it shifts from food um management to bullet management right right? you know but even um metal gear solid 3 there's a little bit of a survival element to oh yeah because there's like the hunger bar and you have to you have to hunt animals you have to eat snakes and Mm -hmm. talk about how they taste yeah but uh, it's awful it's horrible how they they how they taste snake (laughs) but even with like resident evil because i'm i'm a big fan of the uh of first three resident evil games some of my favorite games ever uh like yeah, you could call them survival games. There is this aspect of bullet management and whatnot, but like I, it doesn't really feel like the same thing. Yes. Resident Evil 3 introduced a quasi-crafting system um, in which you could find gunpowders to make bullets. And so then, you know, you got to figure out, okay, well, do I want to make the weaker uh, handgun bullets and have more of them, or do I want to conserve my gunpowder and make fewer of the magnum bullets because those are more powerful? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess there was a little bit of that with the herb uh, yeah, there combination. was like herb, herb mixing in the uh, first game. But, but it was so minor and yeah. had such such a small... Because, you know, you found a green herb and you're going to mix it with a red herb. That's, mm-hmm. that's what was going to happen. So, yeah, for a good number of years there, at least in sort of um, mainstream gaming, survival kind of transitions into survival horror. I mean, I think survival horror is a different genre. It takes the yeah. forefront, I think, at least in my experience. I yeah, mean. I mean, well, I think survival horror was a way to differentiate between action-heavy horror games and horror games in which you had really limited ways mm-hmm. in which to fight back. If you had a weapon, you had really limited ammo, so you'd have to be careful about how to use it so it wasn't about blasting it and killing monsters. It was just about separating one type of horror from another. Mm-hmm. Right. And that is not the survival genre. It's, it's not part of the survival genre at all, with the exception of survival horror games that no. are also survival games. The term survival horror was coined in Japan in English. English, so it was largely about putting two words that sounded <laughs> cool together and describe the game yeah. than it was about saying this is an extension of another genre. Mm-hmm. But So it seems like survival maybe wasn't as popular, right. at least in our culture, as survival, survival horror kind of was at right. that time period. Because right. no. there were survival games coming out. 
Right, yeah. yeah. They were they were limited, but I've always loved survival games. So I've played as many of them as I can. But they were, and they were still described as survival games. Mm-hmm. So I see them as two completely different genres, mm-hmm. but there's just a lot of confusion because the names are so similar. Well, I mean, my, my whole point for bringing it up was just that I really feel like, and I could be wrong on this, but I really feel like survival horror was kind of drowning out mm-hmm. the survival genre. Mm-hmm. And it did you know create confusion in labeling genres whereas survival horror is an offshoot of the horror genre and not an offshoot of the survival genre well i think there's also an aspect of the fact that developers and publishers just presumed that the north american market wanted more action heavy games Mm -hmm. so that's what they produced more at least in the consoles Mm -hmm. i like i'm not as familiar with that era in the pc gaming mandy is so she can tell me one way or the other i mean i I actually except for mech games i played more survival games on console because i was so into survival (laughs) kids back back in the day but there weren't a lot of them released in north america right no, there's Sorrel Kids, Lost in Blue, um, SOS, uh, I, I, and then some of the hard. Disaster Report series. I had to work hard to get a raw danger. Yeah, and no, I, never I mean, saw it they, they were released too. They just weren't, not all the Disaster Reports. I think Disaster Report 1 and 2 were the only ones that have mm-hmm. been released here. Mm-hmm. Which is a shame because I'd love to play some right now. I mean, yeah, no, there's a new one coming out. It looks super fun. Mm-hmm. But Come stateside? Uh, they haven't confirmed, but it's not out in Japan yet. So. Mm-hmm. But by and large, I feel like the, the act, more action-heavy games got the more attention just because that's what people felt like the customers wanted. Mm-hmm. So, similar to why it's taken this long for walking simulators to get big, because people just presumed nobody wanted them, uh, right up until they were available, and then suddenly, well, holy shit, people want these. And I, I think that's sort of what dictates a lot of things, you know. Resident Evil's a smash hit. Survival horror is attached to it, so it's like, well, we gotta start making these survival right. horror games to fill this need that we didn't know existed. Right. Survival kind of gets lost in the mix a little bit, but then, boom, it explodes in everybody's face. Minecraft oh, hits, the, hits the scene, and yeah. people all of a sudden, companies, I think, specifically start paying attention to the fact that the numbers are huge for a genre that they had kind of overlooked, and now it sort of dictates... Oh, no, Everything. absolutely. Minecraft is really, I would describe it as survival light, mm-hmm. in that you don't have to concentrate too heavily. Mm-hmm. It's Saturday morning survival. Yeah, that's a, that's a good descriptor, I like I it. I coined that shit. <laughs> Put some DRM on it. Yeah. But uh, it's really a build-your-own-experience game, and mm-hmm. I think that, more than anything, is what players wanted, but mm-hmm. a lot of people picked up on the survival element specifically, and so in the PC realm we saw a huge explosion of survival games, and many of them did very well, but I think a lot of it is about people wanting to build their own experience, mm-hmm. more so than people wanting survival mechanics specifically. Mm-hmm. Well, and I feel like that's, in addition to that, like I, I think Mandy's com- correct, uh, but also the same thing happened with the crafting. People saw that Minecraft did a lot of crafting, so now every game has to have crafting crafting mechanics too, uh, even though, again, that's not what actually Minecraft made Minecraft popular. It was the building your own experience. Mm-hmm. You know, your, your don't starve game, you're like that, re, you're building an experience there. Uh, or I got one game that I've mentioned in a previous episode called The Long Dark. Uh, it gives you a lot of different ways to do stuff and to find stuff and building your own narrative. So, for example, uh, one playthrough, uh, I found a uh, ranger's watchtower by trying to climb up a mountain, and there was enough stuff in there that I could survive for like two days, but then I was out of the canned food that I found, I couldn't smash up any more furniture, and I didn't really have enough clothing to keep myself warm, but I had to see what I could do. I ended up dying of, of exposure in that playthrough, but, you know, that's, that's that narrative. Mm-hmm. And then my next playthrough, I found an abandoned hydroelectric plant uh, and found a bunch of really useful stuff in there. For some reason, there was a wolf in there. Uh, it attacked me, but I managed to kill it with my hunting knife. It bled out. Oh, good. Now I have some meat. Now I have some furs. Uh, so I put that out to cure. I cooked the meat. I searched around the hydroelectric electric plant, found a door that led outside, and then I couldn't get back in the plant. So then I was trying to figure out how the hell to, you know, get back around. Never did figure out how to get back into the plant, but I did find a abandoned mine that brought me to a coastal highway town. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like, that, that's two very different narratives. 
methods that are both really interesting and both based on how am I going to use my area around me in order to survive uh, for that much longer. You know, obviously now Minecraft is on every device known to man. Even the even the Wii U now. Even devices exactly. Which you know, once something hits the Wii U, it's saturated the market. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like the 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 Tetris yeah. of this decade. Honestly, it is. You know, but it got to start on the PC. And for me, I just equate survival predominantly more with PC gaming than I do with console gaming. But but you you know you play you say you play most of your uh, survival games on consoles or handhelds. Uh, that's just because I don't do a, I don't really like mm-hmm. PC gaming very much. Is so. it fair to say though that survival has a stronger footprint on PC? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned this before the break, but I think a lot of the survival games that I'm you know looking at right now are in early access. Yeah. They're not complete games yet, mm-hmm. and you know there's this just massive flood of survival games on the PC mm-hmm. right now. And it has been. There, yeah, there has been for for a few years now. And very few of these are coming to consoles mm-hmm. yet because they're still not finished. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got like Daisy, you've got Rust, you've got yeah. all well, things like that. And and you know, it's just me over here still still waiting for these things to come mm-hmm. over. And and waiting and waiting and waiting and then finally being like, you know, I'm going to try to just get Rust now on PC and then not being able to play it. Well, I think there's two things going on that, that make that happen. Uh, one is that a lot of the uh, survival games that are coming out on PC are just asset flips. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they, they just kind of get pushed through Steam Greenlight because Steam has absolutely no actual way to, to curate that stuff. So people just put out a lot of asset flips. So it that kind of makes it look like there's a lot more survival games than there necessarily is. Mm-hmm. But the other thing is, that Josh is right, a lot of them stay in early access for a while. Uh, even Minecraft was in open beta for like the longest time. Uh, and I think that's because when you're talking about a genre that is trying to emulate, here's a real world situation, or even, you know, here's just this expansive situation with stuff to survive, you always have that moment of, oh, what if I added this thing? Or, oh, what if there was this mechanic? And so the uh, developers that are genuinely trying to make a good experience uh, and a robust experience uh, are might be hesitant to say, okay, here's the completed product, because they're always going, well, what if I come up with that one more mechanic? Or, you know, maybe if I tweak this mechanic, let me see if I can do that. I think, like, it's those two things that uh, culminate in why a lot of them are kind of on PC and not as many of them get to console. Mm-hmm. Well, I think even like th- that aside, you know, games like Stalker, Daisy, uh, H1Z1. Well, speaking of the Daisy, mm-hmm. have you guys heard about the War Z? No, but it does. It sounds like a 1920s dance. <laughs> the War Z, yeah. It was this huge scandal. And it turns out they were stealing assets from the Walking Dead comics. They were mm-hmm. they were finding pictures online of like zombie pub crawls and zombie walks and like stealing assets from just people's personal pictures of like people dressed like zombies. Oh, like their designs. Yes. Oh, jeez. And then their promotional materials. And yeah. Things. Oh, really? Oh. And they made all of these promises in their uh, in their press release, mm-hmm. of, like this game's gonna contain this, this, and this, and this. And when the game came out, it didn't have any of that stuff in, and people started complaining. And then the developers tried to do some damage control and started deleting forum threads whenever people were complaining about about their game. Which is the worst thing you can do. And it's then, the worst. Thing. Right, absolutely. And then after that, they started releasing statistics about like 93% of our players loved the game and like all this stuff like that. <laughs> it's like, where are you even getting these numbers from? <laughs> no, the game dev like regularly posts blogs yeah. on Gamer Sutra. <laughs> And he just makes up these really obvious that he's like, you know, 70% of our players liked this game more than this game, and like 80% of our players 
had a lot of fun if they played it for two hours or more. And it's like, you can't, you, these are the most obviously made up statistics in the world, yeah. man. But he just, he just constantly throws them out. And then uh, when they were deleting posts, people started putting coded messages about how bad the game was. Like, so they'd write really complimentary stuff in the first letters would be spelling out like, help, this is the worst <laughs> game. If you like looked down and read it all. Yeah. But they actually had to change the name. It's called Infestation Survivor Stories now. That rolls off the tongue. <laughs> but uh, the worst thing is they stole assets from a bunch of free-to-play games and they charged 15 bucks for their game. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. But, uh, what a bunch of bad statistic coding jerks. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, um, you know, you mentioned Don't Starve, right? Minecraft, obviously. So it seems like there's... Um, I don't know if I want to say a resurgence, but a decent uh, push in the survival game genre from indie developers right. who uh, are able to sort of bring sort of interesting twists as opposed to just, you know, surviving zombies. Uh, one of my favorite games of all time is a survival game that was released by a Russian studio called Ice Pick Lodge, and it's uh, called Pathologic. You choose a character you play as, and you show up in a city that's been struck by a weird disease mm -hmm. to help. And once you get to the city, everything falls apart. The city is placed under quarantine and nobody can leave and people are dying. And so it's just brutal survival mechanics because you have to manage hunger, thirst, exhaustion, avoid getting or of some kind of plague <laughs> that's going around, uh, avoid being murdered or something else. But what's really interesting about it is that the most important stat you probably have to manage is reputation. Hmm. Uh, having a strong relationship with characters and having people have a high opinion of you is crucial to anything that'll happen next because if you pull a dash in this war of mine and steal a bunch of food from old people yeah, old and other people, people. <laughs> and other people hear about it, you'll have a terrible reputation and then people will think, well, like so and so is a monster, I can just go kill them and take their stuff because the play the community AI in that game is so good. Mm -hmm. And so if you act like a terrible person the people around you will value your life less so it makes the game harder for you because people will be way more likely to try and kill you yeah. if you survive by acting like a jerk and doing crappy things but then you're in a situation where like you're starving to death and stealing is the only way mm -hmm. so you have to carefully manage your reputation versus your needs mm -hmm. and only do terrible things when you absolutely have to or can hide it mm -hmm. from everyone Everybody in an efficient way so it won't actually damage your reputation. Wow. And they still, I've never played. Pathologic, for the record, is a mess. They're remaking it uh -huh. right now. There was a remastered version released in 2015. I would say it was almost unplayable before that. Yeah. And, uh,. It's still maybe not a great game, and I think developers would agree. But what it does well, it does so well, and it's so unique. It's just, it's still one of my favorite games of all time. Mm -hmm. When the remake is released, it should be wonderful, and I hope everybody plays it, because I think it could be the greatest game of all time. Great. <laughs> so it sounds like you want to be a Daryl and not a Merle in that game. I guess. Uh, it's Walking Dead, right. but... It, I don't watch Walking it, Dead. It's Walking Dead TV show, and that kind of works. Right. So the reputation management in Pathologic sounds really interesting, mm -hmm. and like that alone kind of makes me want to play it. So I hope they get a more playable version released soon. Mm -hmm. You can play Pathologic HD now, and uh, the new version is due to come out in 2016. So like, are there are there any other survival games coming up that have like interesting mechanics or, or premises like that? Yeah, there's We Happy Few where. Uh, Everyone in your society is supposed to be on drugs that make you happy, a drug called joy, and so you have to fake being on drugs <laughs> oh, wow. so that you don't, you know, get caught by the government who sees you're not taking the drugs that they're mm -hmm. mandating that their citizens take to maintain peace. So you wow. have to survive while modifying your behavior so that people around you don't notice you're not on fake happiness. Mm. 
<laughs> it's kind of like uh, Brave New World, the yeah. novel. It's yeah. kind of like yeah. No, that, they said that was one of the major inspirations I, for the game. But no, it looks so cool, and I think it, it hasn't come out yet, so I haven't played it, but I'm really curious to mm-hmm. see what sort of crazy things you're going to have to do. Yeah. And I love having to think about that or survival and like having to make that choice, like, this is the most efficient thing for me to do, but these are all the consequences mm-hmm. I'm going to have to face. Yeah, because it's not even necessarily only then about you know what you do but how you present yourself while you're doing it. yeah right right and and that to me is what makes the best survival games when you're like okay so here's the system the system isn't going to change on you they're not going to change the rules how are you going to survive within the system you eventually get to a point where you're there's some desperation and you're like okay I need to eat now. And so you start being more reckless or more creative and trying to push the limits of what you're able to do in interesting ways. And Mm -hmm. that's, that's for me when survival games get the most interesting. It's Mm -hmm. like, you know, and this, this war of mine really pushes that pretty heavily. Um, Don't starve when you're first starting out and first learning to play. It pushes that pretty heavily too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I find that very interesting of like, oh, discovering what you're willing to do or how creative you're able to be to, mm-hmm. to get yourself out of that situation. Yeah, State of Decay had a really tense sort of management quality to it. Zombie apocalypse, you know, what are you going to do? But uh, so, you, you know, you're trying to manage your fuel, your food and your weapons, um, ammo in your encampment for your people who, you know, are People are constantly coming to be with you. There are other groups around you that ask you for your help. You help one of them, maybe they have a doctor. You don't know. Um, but people's morale lowers as time goes on and they're more stressed. And so you have to take a guy out for a walk in the park to basically cheer him up. And there are hordes of zombies. And it's like one of those things where every accomplishment is very short-lived because there's already two or three things on the horizon that you're constantly worrying about, not to mention this permadeath. So you get a good character and, you know, the wrong move, he's dead boom he's out but I'll, I'll posit the question the future of survival games what are we thinking oh i think there'll be a glut of survival games on console mm-hmm. because there have been so many of these early access games that have been just waiting for console release for so long and eventually we're going to hit a point where most of those are showing up on console you're already seeing some of them that were waiting for years being mm-hmm. released even in 2016 mm-hmm. and uh, then the AAA developers who have been playing catch up and realizing that players are really drawn to survival games releasing their own games and more polished indie studios uh, developing survival games directly for consoles mm-hmm. so I think we're going to go from very slim pickings on console to just an overwhelming amount of games to choose from mm-hmm. I mean in, in a lot of ways you could say that PS3, Xbox 360 era was very, very defined by the first-person shooter. You know, everyone who wanted to make a game was suddenly making a first-person shooter, and uh, we sort of got tired of it. I think, I think survival games are kind of this generation's first-person shooter. That's mm-hmm. kind of what I'm anticipating, is yeah. that pretty soon everything is going to be a survival game, and then we're going to get tired of it, and at the end of this generation, we're going to start moving on to something else. Mm-hmm. Do you think it'll get to a point, obviously, RPG mechanics bled over into action games, dating sims, as we've discussed, mm-hmm. bled over into RPGs and things of that nature. Are we going to see a Mass Effect where you're hooking up with chicks, but you need to stop and have a sandwich? Um, oh, I think for sure we're going to, I mean, and we're seeing, even, we were just talking about Tomb Raider, even that has super, super light survival mechanics, mm-hmm. but some survival mechanics in that you don't have a hunger bar you have to manage, but your character will say, I need to eat, and so you go shoot an animal. Wait, does she do that? Say that she needs to yeah. eat. Yeah, right, that's how, you, when, at the beginning of the game, uh, when you get oh, out of that right. temple, yeah. and she, you, she says, I need to eat, and you have to go hunt some deer and get deer meat. Yeah, the beginning of the game, I think, sets up a game that never materializes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think that's fair. <laughs> I mean, you do it for, for trophies. Yeah, uh, yeah. And because it's fun. Mm-hmm. It is fun. It's absolutely fun to go around <laughs> slaughtering wildlife without actual need. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think obviously the future of this podcast is going to rely heavily on more of a survival mechanic itself. You know, there's going to be a lot more cherry coke drinking. Uh, the Reverend has a beer meter. 
Yeah, yes. It's getting pretty low right it's now. It's getting low. Getting yeah. low. <laughs> Your meter is low. Need to refill that. Yeah. Survival mechanics in The Witcher 3. You gotta worry about venereal diseases. I mean, the guy's banging everybody. <laughs> Some the of them unicorn based. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, all right. I think kind of brings us full circle. Survival <laughs> mechanics. Unicorn based venereal diseases. <laughs> you don't have sex with you. I know. I know. It's just. That's just such a ridiculous. If anything, the unicorn would be at risk because you're barebacking on it. <laughs> I mean, I guess you'd be more likely to spread something like shingles mm-hmm. than a venereal disease. <laughs> to the unicorn? No, okay, from the unicorn. Oh, from the unicorn. Yeah, right. Uh, I'm saying contact or like athlete's foot. Right. Something very, very funky, though. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's bacteria there. It's just, you're not... <laughs> you're just, you're, well, no, because it's a magical contact. beast, so it's probably relatively <laughs> pristine. Uh, that brings us to the close of another educational, family-friendly episode. <laughs> <laughs> You've all survived. Hopefully you haven't lost any of you along the trail. Uh, looking down the road, I'm excited for what's to come. I haven't had a good survival um, experience in a while, and uh, it looks like there's a couple of good ones coming out the pipe. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, Half Glass Gaming out. Awesome. What was I thinking? <laughs> Although you can feed Wasserman chili to himself as well. Mm-hmm. Like cut off his arm. This is getting grotesque, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop that train of thought right there at that station. I'm going to edit that out, but I'm going to save it for evidence. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's reasonable. I, I can't fault that. <laughs>